Feeling insecure and not good enough leads to you talking some serious smack to yourself. You end up feeling anxious, crappy, and even jealous. Research shows that your insecurity and all that disapproval inside your head not only hurts your physical and mental health, but it also negatively impacts how both you and your partner feel about your relationship. So when you become more secure, you'll silence your inner critic and improve all your relationships, really. So today I'm teaching you the seven signs of insecurity and my top five tips to overcome insecurity so you can quiet your inner critic. So stay tuned. How are you? Good to be back on the podcast. I miss you. I miss being here. I love hanging out with folks. I love this time every week. I worked really hard on today's podcast, so I'm very excited about it. I have been getting busy. Kids are going back to school uh, like tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's not tomorrow, but it's, it's soon. And so just getting all that ready. And of course, I'm thinking of all the things I wanted to get done this summer that I didn't finish. Uh, my book, Negative Thinking Sucks and Not in a Good Way. I know you've noticed it's not out yet. I know. <sighs> I'm working on it. It's going to happen. I've also been working on some merchandise, which I'm very excited about. I've never done that before. I didn't think there was anything kind of, you know, worthy to put on merchandise, but I have come up with some amazing things I'm really excited about. So I will talk about those as soon as I get that going. Um, because really the goal, I didn't want to just, you know, create a shirt for you to wear or something or a mug. I, I wanted something that felt inspirational and really, um, really true to who I am and what I want you to feel every day. So anyway, I am there. I am creating it. I'm pretty excited. We'll stand a lookout for that. And if you haven't read my current book, number one Amazon bestseller yet, Be Happily Married, even if your partner won't do a thing, please get it. It's awesome. I'm really proud of that book. I've worked really hard on it. And it's on Audible and all the places. And if you have read it, I've had some of you write into me, which is so nice, and tell me how much the book helped and uh, how much you appreciated it. If you could please show the love and leave a review on Amazon, it just, it really helps. I hate asking for this stuff, but it's what is. It's my life here with you. I need to make these asks uh, so that things get found and, you know, all, all, all the love comes to more people. And you know, we're trying to create world peace. And we know if more people read books like this, we'd be much closer. So uh, please help me out. I think that's it for that. So I am excited to get to it. So first things first, let's do it. Abby, how do I know if I'm insecure? I'm sure you're asking that right now. Well, there are seven major signs of insecurity from my experience. And I would say this, if you only have one of these, I'd say, you know, you probably don't have much to worry about as far as insecurity goes. But if <laughs> you have more than one of these or a lot of these seven, I let's pay some very close attention today. Today's for you. Today, today's your jam. So let's talk about number one. Number one is, number one sign of insecurity to me is how you feel right? It's obvious, but I like to say it out loud because I don't think people get it. If the predominant feelings in your life, if you stepped back for a moment and you thought about your life and your relationships and the predominant feelings are things like doubt, anxiety, uncertainty, that that's there all the time, that, you know, you maybe you constantly worry that you've made a wrong choice or that you're doing something wrong or that, you yourself are wrong, which makes me sad, but I know that happens. If you just, you know, you feel different somehow, misunderstood, no one has it like you or can really understand, you, you know, you feel like you have that kind of unicorn issue, uh, that's insecurity. All right, so that's number one. Number two, if decisions are your enemy. So sometimes insecurity shows up as researching options exhaustively. You know, you're asking everyone's opinion and advice before making a decision and then still worried that you're choosing wrong, that you're doing it wrong. You could also find yourself in a, very commonly this analysis paralysis. You just keep researching and agonizing without ever making a decision. 
so if, and I do have a whole thing on analysis paralysis. So if you want to learn more about that, I will link to that in the show notes. Um, but you know, let, let's get through that. All right. Number three, number the third sign that you might have an insecurity issue is that you need constant reassurance. So, you know, you're always seeking out other people's support and not just their support, their agreement and their assurance. And frankly, it's kind of never enough. You'll ask the same questions over and over. uh, And what I experience, what happens is that then other people get exasperated with you or they snap at you (laughs) and that amps up your insecurity. It makes it worse. So uh, I had a client recently a couple I was working with and um, literally she in session, she was saying to her partner, um, you know, you say you love me all the time and you do all these nice things. And she listed all these wonderful things he does. But then she said, but you know, I don't know, that, but I don't know if you really love me, if you really mean it. I don't know if I can believe you. She started saying this stuff. It's like, what does this poor guy have to do? What does he have to do to show you that he loves you? You know, this again, isn't about him at this point. So, but, and that might be happening to you in some way, some way that you don't feel good about what you're doing without someone else's stamp of approval. And you need the stamp over and over again. That's another sign. Okay. Uh, And I will, so, okay. So I don't want to go too far into that. All right. So sorry, I was going to go down a road. Now I'm not going to. All right. Number four, your self-esteem sucks. You often, this goes without saying, I would think, but I really want to point it out. You know, if you often don't feel good enough for your partner or for your friends or, you know, that somehow you're the something, you know, weird sheep in your family or always feeling like an imposter at work, you know, they're going to figure out that you're scamming them somehow, even though you work your butt off. Your confidence is rocky at best. If that's there, if you, you know, think about that, that's low self-esteem. If you feel unworthy often, um, another way it shows up, you know, when you quickly dismiss any kudo or compliment any, you know, Hey, that was a great job on that project. Or, you know, Hey, you look beautiful today, whatever you quickly dismiss anything like that. And you don't allow yourself to feel good about your accomplishments or how you act in the world. Uh, again, that's a problem. And I do have, as always, <laughs> another podcast on how to build self-esteem and confidence. And so, uh, I'll link to that in the show notes also. All right. Number five signs that you're likely insecure is the good old perfectionism. You're a perfectionist, no matter, and this can show up in different ways. I have had a lot of clients over the years who don't think they're a perfectionist, but they are. So no matter how well you've, you know, you've done something, how well it's gone, it's never quite good enough. Or you're always pointing out what you could have done better. Uh, It usually shows up as you being a control freak. I say with love or a control enthusiast, as I like to refer to myself. I just had this happen the other night. I made this really awesome dinner. Everyone, you know, if you've been listening for a while, you know, I'm a food pervert. I love to cook. I'm really into it. I'm actually a really, I'm a really good cook. I can say that. I'm, I'm a good cook. I'm a good baker and a good cook. And yet we were all eating and I was thinking, oh, I could have done this better. Oh, this didn't, I didn't cook that as long as I should have, or that was a little, I'm always pointing out what's wrong with the meal. Always. And I'm not looking for compliments. It's the opposite. Because when they say stuff, I'm running away. I am uh, I am trying to downgrade myself somehow. It's crazy. It's Somehow I'm insecure, even though I really know I'm a good cook. I do. I enjoy my own cooking. I've gotten lots of compliments. I feel very confident about it. Yet, here I sit doing this. It's this perfectionism quality I have. It's just never good enough. It's like, my gosh, Abby, what's the issue? <laughs> so... If, uh, you know, if, if you're anywhere in there, it's a problem, you know, deep down, you, you just don't feel like who you are or what you do is ever enough. That's really what perfectionism is. Uh, and of course, because I'm a control enthusiast, I do have, again, um, there's podcasts on how to deal with your own control issue or what to do if your partner is controlling. So again, I'll link to those in the notes. Number six sign you're insecure. 
you're insecurely attached. So uh, I've talked a lot about attachment styles and insecure attachment styles and how they affect your relationships. Uh, again, I know, shocking. I did a podcast on it. I'll link to it. And basically it's this, that there's, you know, there's a attachment styles, you know, fall out into three basic categories. Well, two basic, there's secure attachment and insecure attachment. And the insecure attachment is pretty much uh, boils down to uh, avoidant and uh, anxious. And so when you're securely attached, it really just means that your caregivers, the, you know, whoever took care of you as a kid, uh, really helped you in the world, develop confidence and feel good in the world and all that. And when you're insecurely attached, either neg with anxiety or, um, listen, I just can't get there, or avoidance, then uh, that you weren't made to feel that way. And I can tell you that your insecurity, again, it, it's just, it's, it's usually direct, you know, from how you were parented. So if you have, a, let's say you have an anxious attachment style, it means that you basically rely on your partner or other people for your emotional well-being. And you likely, I, I, what I see a lot is people have like a fantasy of some perfect relationship that they can never have because those don't exist. So, you know, you're left feeling, think about it, you're left feeling insecure and lonely. You, you can never get this thing you want. Um, or you might have the avoidant attachment style. And that's where you stay emotionally distant from those around you. And it's interesting because I think on the outside, it, you know, there's this disengagement, right? And this can look, it can actually look kind of confident from the outside, but it's not. It stems from insecurity. You know, you're, if you have this, you're distancing yourself because you don't trust that anyone can really meet your needs. So you actually feel insecure in your relationships uh, and that, so that, and that, so that's a whole different thing. And again, there's this insecurity and you just live it, bring it on, and and uh, we end up with it in your adult relationships and life. Okay. And then number seven, so I've gone through, right, all these ways that you know that you're insecure. Number seven, and you might not like this, but it's the truth, you judge other people. Uh-huh. <laughs> If you're judging or criticizing other people often, if you find yourself doing that, it's because you're insecure. Secure people feel no need to tear other people down, worry what other people are doing or thinking. They're not busy pointing out what others are doing wrong because they're off living their happy, secure lives. <laughs> so that judgmental and critical voice you use with others, that's why this is a problem. Really think about it. So that it's because you're kind of having a judgmental and critical voice all the time and you just turn it on yourself, you turn it on others, it's just, it's just everywhere. And again, all stemming from that insecurity. So, and when it gets turned on yourself, of course, the real pain begins. That's where all the rubber hits the road. That is your critical inner voice. So I wanna talk about your critical inner voice next, okay? Get ready. So, your critical inner voice well, let me just, okay. So all of this insecurity <laughs> that I just discussed leads to this very critical inner voice, like I said. I wanna just make sure I'm saying this well for you. So, and all day long, you've got an internal dialogue going in your head. And that's whether you realize it or not. So, and because you feel the way you think, I say this a lot, you feel the way you think, all that negative thinking, all that way that you're explaining things to yourself all day, is leading to all those unwanted feelings because again we feel the way we think so whatever you're thinking up there that's how you're feeling in the real world so you know so maybe you're wondering you maybe you're me you're wondering you know where you left your keys where i leave my keys what you want for dinner what do i want for dinner uh something like that when you're doing that you're also evaluating and explaining those things to yourself i know it doesn't seem that way all the time but that's what's happening you are thinking, oh, where are my keys? But then there's all these other things that you're thinking too. And you sometimes catch yourself in these thoughts and sometimes you don't. So uh, when you're wondering, you know, where, so you're walking around, where did I leave my keys? You also might have in your head, what's wrong with me? Why am I always losing stuff? Uh, and then you might even take that deeper. Uh, uh, I'm getting old. I forget everything now. Oh, I forgot that thing the other day at work. You know, you go, you go down that rabbit hole, right? Um, I had a client the other day, this is, well, 
this is a little while ago, a few weeks ago, but it stuck out in my head. She was talking about um, dinner. What that she she noticed this. Sorry, she was explaining to me what it, uh, this thought process that had happened. So I was really proud of her that she noticed. But here's what she said happened. She's thinking about what she wanted for dinner. She's like, oh, what should I make for dinner? I'm feeling kind of, you know, it's getting to be that time. I got to think about dinner. And she said, she said, I ended up down this pessimistic rabbit hole. Um, so what I want for dinner turned into uh, her then thinking of things she wanted and thinking, ugh, I can't eat those things because I'm getting too fat. I put on these COVID pounds and I really gain weight and I look terrible and I need to make something healthy for dinner. And then she started thinking about, her kids and her husband and how they were not going to like when she makes these healthy things and then no one likes anything and they don't eat it and they complain to her and she feels like then she goes back in the kitchen and makes more and then she starts getting resentful sure my two teenage sons can eat whatever they want and so can my husband and not gain weight but I can't right that doesn't work for me uh you know and then she started thinking about her husband he never puts my needs first it's always about him and what he needs and then it really started to go left she's started thinking about how he's, she thinks he's losing interest because of her weight. And I, I know I can tell, and she was telling me all these things that she was using as proof, which really were not proof. But, and then of course she started thinking about some woman that he's been working with on this team he's on, uh, who's very educated and pretty. And so if I don't lose this weight, I'm gonna lose him. And then I need to tell you, the whole thing ended with her thinking she was gonna die alone. I hand to God. <laughs> So she went from, what do I want for dinner, to I'm going to die alone. And don't be, don't be judging and laughing because you know you've done this. You know you've done this. You've done something very similar. Again, I was really proud that she sort of caught it. But you can see how quickly the crazy train leaves the station. So, but you might, what, what happens is folks will say to me, but where, like, where does this start? I don't understand. When did I start being so critical of myself? When did that negative voice in my head start? Because it's hard. And sometimes people are really clear, like, I always remember it being there. Others think it's been worse later. And really what I tell people is it started, you know, whenever you start to feel insecure. And so I will say, some people become insecure later in life, and that's often related to um, some major incident happening. Um, I had a client who found out that her husband of 30 years was gay and had been living a lie all these years. I've had more than one client with this, by the way, but uh, he'd been he'd been living he'd been living like a secret life. He'd been um, you know this whole other thing, and so. He left very quickly from the relationship, from the marriage. They didn't go to counseling, nothing. He just said, I'm gay, I'm out. And he then proceeded to act like a jerk about things, it seemed. I only have her side, but, you know, it didn't look good. Anyway, for her, literally the bedrock of her life, the thing that she, you know, she was, she's in her 60s now. She's picturing her retirement and her, you know, where they're going to live and where they're going to settle down, you know, later. And now it's all gone, all of it all of it, everything she's believed, everything's upended. And as you can imagine, it's like, it's like the rug got pulled out from under her, right? Just, she, and of course she started to question everything, everything she thought was true. Now she's questioning, well, hello, that's gonna make you insecure, <laughs> okay? So yeah, so something like that could happen. You might not have been so insecure before, but then there was this big thing. But I think for most of us, it did start in our childhood and the people, really and, and the people and the circumstances that were around us when we were in our quote unquote formative years. And obviously there's other variables, gender, birth order, the environment outside your home, uh, changes in the family, maybe there was a divorce or bankruptcy or something, at, you know, critical points. There's all kinds of other things. But it, it really all boils down to how the important people in your life growing up interacted with you and how you perceived what was happening and being said. So, you know, you could have been that little kid who spilled a glass of juice, you know, as most kids do. <laughs> but instead of a parent saying, hey, don't, you know, oh, don't worry, these things happen, it's okay. Maybe that parent, or maybe even a sibling, you said something like, oh, you're such a klutz, what's wrong with you? You're always doing things like this. I always have to clean up after you, something like that. Uh, maybe you had a parent who was often judging or criticizing you. 
uh, you know, oh, give me that. You're always doing it the wrong way. Um, maybe someone dismissed or demeaned your efforts or your wins. Again, it could have been a, a maybe you were compared to an older sibling, something like that, that or another sibling. Uh, you know, you should quit piano and try something else. You never be as good as your sister. Or I, I had, I've had this a lot. People were compared to other families' kids. You know, why can't be, you be more like James, you know, from down the street, that kind of thing. You could have had an absent or neglectful parent who rarely interacted with you. So, uh, and as, you know, and this, this really comes up a lot in different ways because um, as an adult, you can intellectually know, like say, I've had this a few times. I've had clients who've had single parents, usually a single mom. Uh, it's, it's, I have had single dads over the, you know, parent, uh, clients who've had a parent, a single dad parent, but usually it, it was a single mom. And, you know, she was, let's say working three jobs. So she was not spending much time at home. She was very loving when she was home, you know, really there. And I think this is sometimes the most confusing because, uh, you know, the, the kids know, and she would tell them, Hey, I love you. I, I have to work these jobs. That's why I'm not here. Otherwise I'd be here with you. And, so, and they've heard that and they believe it. The problem is that as an adult, you can understand that. Kids can't rationalize that way. That's not how kid brains work. Kids, kids are not just little adults. They actually, their brains are developing over time. You know, our brains aren't fully developed until our mid to late twenties. Um, and that part of the brain that can figure all this stuff out, the things that aren't concrete, uh, kid brains are very concrete. So anything that's abstract like this, kid brains have no clue, and I mean no clue, how to understand. So a kid could hear those words and feel their mom's love, but just felt alone and insecure because, and somewhat unlovable because their mom wasn't there. Again, so knowing the facts doesn't change that. And that gets really confusing as adults because you're thinking, why am I insecure? I had a really badass mom <laughs> or whoever, or parents, you know, and I had all these things and blah, 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 yet I'm insecure. And it's because again, it also, you could have a sibling who grew up in that same house who isn't insecure because of other factors that happened for them. So you can, so that's why it's hard. You can't compare. Um, but then you end up judging yourself. Why am I this way? I shouldn't be this way. I had all these things. It, it can be very insidious. It can be very sneaky. So I'm saying all this because of that. And obviously you could have just had a neglectful or absent parent who just was neglectful or absent. You know, they, of their own choice, they weren't a good parent, whatever. And, or you could have been on the other end of the spectrum. I have, I have, Plenty of clients who've been here with a really anxious or overbearing parent or parents who, or grandparents or whoever, who, you know, smothered them, made them feel like they couldn't make a decision without their input, made them think that if they thought something that wasn't what the parent thought or the guardian thought that it was wrong, uh, you know, so you're going to grow up thinking that showing love means enmeshment. And so as an adult, anything less than that, you know, someone being like that with you, it doesn't feel like they really love you. That So you're going to feel insecure, right? Can, can you see where I'm going here? Can you, can you pick up what I'm laying down? And you might even feel unlovable, um, which is really sad. So, okay. So th there's also events that can happen outside the home that contribute to feelings of insecurity and again, lead to that critical inner voice. It could have been a, a you know, it could have had a coach humiliate you in front of your team, uh, a teacher who embarrassed you, you know, always pointing out your mistakes to the class or something. It just somewhere along the line, you were given feedback or experienced something where you felt wrong or bad on the inside. And that's the bottom line. And again, it doesn't, this isn't about uh, blaming people. You know, I'm not about that. If you've been listening for any amount of time, you know, I'm not about blame, but I am about explaining. I'm not trying to justify anyone's behavior. It, this isn't about that. Everyone was doing, is doing the best with the tools they have, including you, but also including your parents and whoever else. So, and you have to believe that because it's the truth of it. Their tools might suck, but they were doing the best they could. So it's not about blaming, but it is about um, understanding truly so that you can explain it it can make sense it can be rational so you can then have a more rational view on why you might be insecure or have low self-esteem or whatever the thing is or be acting you know sabotaging relationships or whatever you might be doing instead of just you know blaming yourself uh you know insecurity is 
it's tough. <laughs> There's a, you know, Brene Brown, um, uh, of course, everyone knows Brene Brown, the queen, right? Uh, she says that insecurity and eventually, you know, that negative inner critic, she says that that insecurity comes from feelings of shame. And she describes shame, uh, her definition is very good, it's, it's an intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Yeah. I, I, I feel insecure saying that out loud, of course. So you can see where that all comes together. And I will say that because in the end, and if you're a parent now, take this to heart. If you're not a parent yet, take it to heart. And if... Uh, well, okay, I'm not gonna, I don't want you to judge yourself if you don't do this. That's what I was thinking for a moment. But you do need to know that, you know, kids need to feel accepted for who they are to feel se secure. And I've talked about, you know, unconditional love versus unconditional acceptance and how unconditional acceptance is so much more important um, than unconditional love because we don't feel the love unless we feel accepted. So you, you got to have that. And uh, there's a there's a book I read it was a while ago, um, Parenting from the Inside Out. It's by Dr. Daniel Siegel. I'll link to it in the show notes. Um, and he says that kids need to feel these four S's, uh, safe, seen, soothed, and secure. And so, I know, safe, seen, soothed, and secure. So if you remember often feeling in your childhood, um, lonely, anxious, sad, jealous, or angry as a kid, you likely didn't get those four things, consist or at least not consistently. You didn't feel accepted for who you were as a kid, and your insecurity and inner critic developed from there. Okay. And there is nothing like a relationship, like a romantic relationship to make you feel really insecure. I know. I have to tell you, I can't tell you, I have to tell you, I can't tell you. Isn't that cute how I said that? All right. I, I've i literally worked with thousands of single people and, you know, in our work together, we'll be talking about their insecurities and all their stuff and you know, their self-esteem, we're building it. We're doing all the work, right? They do amazing work. They make progress. They are killing it. They're kicking ass. And then they get into a relationship and it's all gone. <laughs> or it's maybe not all gone, but it, and I do tell clients this often. I'll say, hey, we can work on all these issues and we can do this while you're single. But once you get in a relationship, we're going to have to work on them again. You know, we're going to have to do that next level of them. Because again, it's the relationship that really brings up all the gunk. And it will... Romantic relationships, they stir up old hurts, those resentments, they get the insecurity juices flowing and suddenly got that negative inner voice, it's back full force, going, going. And next thing you know, maybe you're feeling clingy, desperate, or uh, you pull back, you know, you sabotage when things get too close, whatever it is, you're screwing it up in some way or, you know, you feel like you are. And because, you know, as you get into or, at, you know, as you deepen uh, feelings in a romantic relationship and your, your feelings of security and worth, they get challenged. So all those insecure feelings increase and your inner critic starts to get really loud. And I want to say some things I hear a lot. Something like, I'm never going to find anyone else who gets me as well as this person. No one's going to ever love me again the way this person loved me. I hear that one a lot. That's not true. Of course it's not true. Nobody's, there's no unicorns in the world. Let it go. Um, he's, uh, what I explained before, he, he says he loves me, but I don't believe him. Uh, I, I don't know if I can believe him. Uh, if I don't lose weight, he's going to cheat on me. Getting told she's too good for you. Uh, thinking, um, I'm better off on my own. Or why do I always say the wrong thing? If I, if I hadn't said X last night, she'd still be here. Uh, if I just hadn't texted so soon, he wouldn't have ghosted me. Uh, I'm too needy. I need to stop asking for things. Um, and I'm not saying you might not be needy in some way, but usually in my experience, it's not neediness. <laughs> it is just asking, just saying what you need and feeling like it's too much because the other person is balking. 
So any of that stuff is your insecurity showing up and your fear taking over. And obviously we don't want any of that. So let's get to it. Let's get to it. Let's get to uh, my top five tips to overcome insecurity so you can quiet your inner critic. Here we go. Number one, you're going to be shocked to hear this one. I'm going to get all Jewish mother bossy on your ass right now. It's you have to practice mindfulness. I know. I don't know what to tell you. I do not have a magic bullet. There is no pill you can take. You got to do this. You got to, got to. I say with love, you know, I love you so much. I love you so much. It's why I harp on this so much. It's why I have so many free resources about this. If you don't practice mindfulness, you're not going to be able to do any of the tips I'm about to give you. Just not. End of. If you catch yourself lovingly, <laughs> you know, if you can catch yourself lovingly when you're acting insecure or when your inner critic is in full torpedo mode, you, that's when you can change it. If you don't catch yourself, how do you expect to change it? Again, I have tons of re resources on this. I'm going to have them all linked wherever you're seeing this, reading this, whatever. It's all going to be there uh, because you got to get better at mindfulness and self-awareness, which are two different things. Again, I talk about that too in other places. I'm not going to go into it here because you know, you, you've all heard it from me before. I will mention my, uh, download my free mindfulness starter kit if you do nothing else so you can start making mindfulness a habit. And I'm not exaggerating. It's literally in minutes a day. Minutes. I know you have minutes. Okay. Am I done being bossy? Am I getting off my soapbox? Yes. Number two, my second tip is you got to focus on the inside, not the outside. And what I see is that too many people are trying to base their feelings of security on external things, you know, a partner, money, job, education, how they look. But that's like trying to fill a funnel. It never works because, you know, think of a funnel. You're, you're filling it in. I'm filling in all the education and the things and the working out and the eating well and the partner and all things. But it, you've got a big leak in the bottom of the funnel. You have this, bit, this hole that things are just coming out of. So that's why it's never enough. You're always looking for more. You never feel good in your, you know, in your moments or they're so brief and fleeting they go. You always have to, you know, more reassurance, more whatever, do the next thing because you're trying to fill a funnel. Uh, and when, if your weight fluctuates or your relationship ends, you're destroyed. You, 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 it's all over because of this outside friggin' thing. And it's not cool. It is not cool. You have to stop. You have to stop. I've said it a million times and it's the truth. We don't get the things and feel happy. The research shows it. It's from the research people. I'm not saying this as like some stupid platitude. We know it's true. We know it's true. <laughs> so happy people get the things. That's kind of how it works. And, and when I say happy people, you don't have to run around with like rainbows coming out of your ass. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about feeling more content and satisfied with where you are in your life in, on, in a consistent way. Obviously, all of us, me included, sometimes don't feel satisfied with something. That's fine. That's cool. But let that be a motivator and inspirational, not you know negative and not holding you back. You've got to start liking yourself regardless of what's happening out there. And if you've listened to me before, you're going to hear my probably favorite quote. I always have a lot of favorite quotes. <laughs> uh, from Roman emperor and Stoic philosopher. You know, I love the Stoics, uh, Marcus Aurelius. And he very famously said, the blazing fire makes flames and brightness out of everything thrown into it. I, I'm, ooh, do you like that pregnant pause? I'm leaving that there for a moment. The blazing fire makes flames and brightness out of everything thrown into it. You need to be the blazing fire. And when, anything that comes, it just creates more. It's flames and it's brightness. So that's your job. And I really recommend starting every day with some daily centering routine in the very beginning of the day. I will link to mine, to what I do, uh, 
in everywhere you might be seeing, reading, watching this. I will link to um, how I do that every day, but you've got to have something in your morning. And it needs to be a little more than going for a run. Exercise is great. I do that too. But this is different. This is a connection to yourself on another level. And I, you really got to get your brain in the right direction. Okay. Number three. And this is really easy. Everyone should be able to do this tonight. How do you like that? You don't have to download anything. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to you know, nothing. Just every starting tonight, list a win every single day. I have a really hard time with this, I have to tell you. Um... I should say I'm much better at it now. I have a hard time if someone says to me, hey, what were your wins this week? You know, forget it. But at night, at the course of the day, I can usually uh, think of something. And so right before you go to bed, think back on your day and identify one win. And it doesn't have to be anything big. You could have spoken up at a meeting when you normally keep your mouth closed or maybe you took time out to to finally get yourself a uh, pedicure. Uh, you just want to note the win and here's the big, you want to feel it for a moment, actually let yourself be a little proud of you and then you can go to sleep. You could also do this at another time in the day. Um, you could do it in that morning routine I mentioned, you, you know, from the day before, if you remember, you could also, a great practice is to do it at dinner with your family, have everybody know to win for the day. What a nice thing. Uh, and again, it, you know, can really be, you, you want to emphasize the small things. Uh, if, if you have trouble showering and you showered, great, that's a win. So it, it's not about being patronizing or anything else. It's about understanding that something doesn't have to be epic to be a win if you did it and you set out to do it. So that's cool. All right. Number four of my tips is you have to practice surety. I know. Being sure and confident consistently is a skill. What do I always say? All these things are skills. Listening is a skill. Communication is a skill. Confidence is a skill. Surety is a skill. Be insure, being sure and confident is, is you got to just practice it and you will get better at it. And like any other skill, right? Just again, keep doing it. And over time, it becomes more automatic. And it, so when it comes to decisions, being sure You want to set yourself up for success by creating some kind of little system for yourself. And I will tell you that this is something I do with my clients. So I'm going to lay it to you right now because I love love you so much. Aren't we having fun? Isn't it great being here? I love doing this. Okay. (laughs) You're like, shut up, Abby, and get to it. All right. Here's what I want you to do. These steps. So basically, so here you are, you have trouble with decisions, you're not sure about things, you know, you, you, you don't stick with it, or maybe you make decisions quickly, but then you question them later. Whatever the thing is, it doesn't matter. Here's what you want to do. So you want to put it, so I've got this thing I have to decide, okay? Uh, where I'm going on vacation. I'm going to use an easy one. Where I'm going on vacation. Put a time limit on when you're going to make the decision or the change or whatever it is, but I'm going to say right now it's this. So it's... It's January. I need to plan my summer vacation because I want to take a vacation. But usually I wait so long that I procrastinate and procrastinate and I don't do it. And it's really because I'm not sure. And this I'm waiting for the best trip ever to come along or the best deal ever or the whatever. And or I exhaust, you know, I'm just researching forever and I never pull the trigger. And then, of course, it's too late or you can't get what you wanted or, you know, it's you're paying top dollar for a flight or something or, or you don't end up going because you couldn't do it the way you wanted. So whatever it is. So you're going to put a time limit on making the decision. You're going to stick to it. Put it in your calendar, whatever it is. And by that date, and don't make it super far away. Do not say, I'm going to decide by, you know, May 10th when it's January 1st. No, no, no. Make that by February 1st at the latest. At the latest. That's part of the problem with decisions. We give ourselves too long. Because really, let's be honest. Let's take a moment to love each other for a minute. You wait to the last minute anyway <laughs> to do it if that's happening or you just do it in that moment when the inspiration strikes and you should just do it then. But either way, right, create that, you know, time limit. Then, so now I got my time limit. So we're going to say that I said February, it's now January 1st. I said by February 1st, I'm going to decide where I'm going on vacation and I'm going to pull the trigger and I'm going to um, make all the reservations and do everything by February 1st. So that means 
that now the second step is I have to do my due diligence and research within the time limit. So I might schedule things uh, when I'm going to do that. I, you know, when I'm going to research, I might um, g- delegate that to someone and say, hey, can you look at this piece and I'll do this piece and we'll talk on Wednesday. I don't know, something like that. But, you know, you really want to d- do your research and your due diligence. That's cool. You like doing that anyway. The third thing is if you can make your decision and implement it uh, before your deadline, if you can, I will say that too. Sorry, that's not the third thing, but you know, definitely think of that too. You can do it before the deadline. That's really cool. Sometimes I have people, you know, you have that inspiration to look at the trips and you just book it that day. That's great. That's nothing wrong with that. So if you feel you need other people's opinions, about your trip, your vacation, identify just one or two people to speak to, but that's it. So, and obviously you can see how important this is in a bigger decision. Should I leave my uh, boyfriend? Should I get out of this relationship? If you talk to 50 people, you're gonna get 50 opinions. It's gonna create analysis paralysis. You're never gonna do a thing. If you're thinking about, should I leave my boyfriend over and over, day after day, months and years, there's no end to it. You can see the problem. You gotta, you know, get to that place where you decide there's nothing magical that's necessarily going to happen later. And so if you talk to just, you know, if you're talking to more people, that's what makes it harder and harder to actually create the decision. So whether it's a little decision or a big decision, pick your peeps. I have my peeps. I got my therapist. <laughs> I have my besties. I have I have a few that I use. Sometimes I have a few best friends. So like sometimes I'll use a different one for different things because they have different um, strengths. But that's it. That's it. I talk to those two people and I'm done. Maybe three, depending on the thing. But that's how you want to think about things. So, right? So that So just speak to a couple. Now you have to implement your new decision or, or your action or your strategy by the deadline, and here's the next piece, and not second guess it. <laughs> you can't second guess it. That's it. I've made it. There are no wrong decisions. Every If, it, if I don't like it later, I'll plan differently next time. I'll learn from it. If, uh, you know, th- but y- you can't get into that there is some all-knowing, all, you're not Oz, you know, and that, that wasn't true anyway, right? The Wizard of Oz, that was all smoke and mirrors. Uh, so, you know, you really have to get that, you know, the, the choices we make in our lives, um, they're just there for learning. And yeah, you might make what you consider a mistake, but if you can re-see that, review it in your head as something you can learn from. What did I learn from this? What am I taking away? That's always the way to go because you you can't undo it. What is the point of the other? There is no point. It doesn't help you make better decisions later to be thinking, oh, I'm always screwing up. I'm always making bad decisions. That makes you make worse decisions later. Do you see where I'm going here? I hear it all the time. Well, I have to be realistic. That It's actually not realistic to think that you're such a screw up. That's not real. Real is whatever you decide is real. Real is however you choose to look at what you're doing. So I will say this, if you need to, you could also decide how long you'll try out a new decision and then stick to that and just not second guess along the way. So sometimes I'll, you know, work with a couple and I'll say to them, you know, you have to come all in to this couple's work for the next three months. You put in every ounce you have. You decide it is absolutely going to work. We are doing this. Uh, I am full in. I am, you know, totally into this. And I'm giving it this period of time with all of my energy. And then at that point, I'm going to reassess. And I'm going to see how I feel then. What do I, do do I want to change my strategy at that point? Do I want to try something different? Because you know how it is. You'll, You'll try something and then go, oh, it's not working. It's not working. Let me try the next thing. Oh, it's not working. Let me try the next thing. And you're really, what's happening is you're digging holes halfway. You know, there's gold if you just kept digging, (laughs) but we give up too soon. But when you set out a timeline like that, it really helps you not waffle back and forth. And anytime you doubt, you can just go, nope, doing this for three months. Don't even have to think about that. I don't have to think about this till till June 1st, whatever. That will really help you. So if you need to, you can put that on the other side. But really what I'd rather is you just make the decision, stick to it, and that's it. And you, again, don't second guess. 
And that last piece of that is to remind yourself, which I kind of already went over, but that, you know, there are no mistakes. Failure is just, you know, I hate that word. <laughs> not, maybe we could call it not having the outcome you originally wanted. It just, you know, it helps you see where you do want to go. Well, now you know what you don't want. Look at what you do want. You, there, it is impossible, impossible to get through life without making uh, choices that you wish you hadn't made. So I, I, I don't know how, you, you, can't say, you can't safeguard against that. You just can't. You just, you got, I mean, you can safeguard against making a million of them. But in my experience, 35 years of doing this, more than, uh, and in my own life and in my friend and all that, I can tell you from literally the thousands of people I've worked with, the ones who stop questioning their past choices and start to think, well, what do I want to do now? What do I want to learn from that? What do I want to take with me? lead much happier lives, make better and better decisions, and really move through their lives, really get to the next place. But if, you can, if you're just going to sit there and regret and regret and doubt and doubt, uh, you can see it, it's not moving it's, and it's not helping you at all. Okay. Number five is collect compliments. I, again, another easy one. I'm giving you like hard ones and easy ones. <laughs> or you know, more intense ones and easy ones. So people say nice things to you all the time and you dismiss it. And it's a big problem because you can't feel more secure if you're not noticing all the things that can help you feel secure. It's definitely uncomfortable in the beginning and your mind will race to all kinds of negative chatter. They don't really mean that. Abby's saying it because I'm paying her. <laughs> They're just being nice. Oh, they have some magical life. They don't know my problems. If they really knew me, they wouldn't say that. I know. I've heard it all. I see you. I see you. It's your job to ignore the chatter, suspend your disbelief, and take in the compliment. And I want to say, too, compliments aren't just like, oh, you look so beautiful today or something. Compliments, you know, it's also just anything nice that's being said. Um... It, and so it could just be uh, something about, um, oh, I, you know, I, uh, I guess they're all compliments now that I think about it. But anytime someone says thank you, hey, uh, thank you for, you know, taking my kid to school. I don't know. It's there. If someone's thanking you for something or giving you a compliment, take it in. <laughs> Let it sit for a minute. And there's there's a few ways you can collect compliments. I call it collecting compliments because you want to use them like a bank so that when you take withdrawals, you have them there. So there's uh, two big ones. So specifically, the one I use a lot is if someone says, gives you a compliment, I want you to put your hand over your heart, just stop and say, thank you. And really breathe it in. Hand over the heart for real. I'm not making this up. It act, Again, there's research on this. Hand over the heart, look them in the eye, and say thank you and allow it in. I have had clients come back and say, I burst into tears doing it. I know. It's because you finally felt it. You finally allowed a little bit of it in. And don't be afraid. You're not going to be bursting into tears, you know, in the in the, in your grocery store. It's, you're going to be okay. So, but you will be amazed at how well this works. And uh, I, I, I got this from a therapist years ago telling me to do it because I suck at comp taking compliments. But... I was shocked at how well it worked myself. And again, I started doing it with clients and it's incredibly effective. So I want you to do that. And don't dismiss, don't, you know, shake it off, just loud in, thank you, move on. And the other one that's really good is to have a bowl of compliments and nice things people said. So get a bowl, pretty bowl, could be a box, whatever you want, but I would make a beautiful bowl in your house, something, buy a beautiful bowl, stick it in your home, have a, you could have little beautiful, you can make pretty strips of paper next to it. You could, <laughs> um, you could, whatever, have sticky notes next to it. I don't care. And whenever someone says something nice to you or gives you a compliment or says thank you, write it down, throw it in the bowl. Just throw it in, throw it in the bowl. You could also, when people come over your house, I know this is crazy, but you can say to them, hey, could you, um, Write down something you like about me or that you think is great that I probably don't realize. And can you write it on that little piece of paper and throw it in the bowl over there? Don't show it to me. Just throw it in. Uh, you can do that. And uh, it's amazing. It is 
so great. So then you have this bowl and when you're feeling down or you're having trouble, you can sort of pull that out to help you feel more secure, to help you again, but you'd have to take it in. You know, read the little slips of paper, take it in. And if you have times when you can compliment yourself, you can throw them in there too. I know, you can compliment yourself, it's all right. Uh, I've had this bowl in my house, but I don't have it right this minute, but I've had it before. And I've wrote in like, hey, great dinner tonight or whatever. So, and I will also say, okay. And so, you know, those are big. And if you're looking to stop in general, your uh, negative self-talk, you know, if there's just like a, a, bigger way you want to do that. I did a whole four arc series on stopping negative thinking. And again, my book is going to be about this, you know, too, but if you want to start right now, so episodes of the podcast 111, 112, 113, and 114 in that order take you through the steps to stop negative thinking that are very effective with my clients and what I use for myself in the whole wide world. So I do want to say that too. But everything I'm teaching you today, you know, that's when you're just going after your inner critic, right? That negative talk in your head. What I'm teach what I just taught you today are the ways to be more self uh, to be more secure, to get over that insecurity, which will also stop the negative voice in your head. So this is another direction to it. This is another way to silence your inner critic and to be feel more secure. To It really works. I promise you, this is what works. When you feel secure, you don't have that chatter, that negative voice in your head all the time. Uh, you know, Louise Hay uh, famously said, you know, you've been criticizing yourself for years and it hasn't worked. Try approving of yourself and see what happens. And it's true, right? It's an amazing thing. So really, you know, in the end, what I want for you is to take action from inspiration, not negative motivation. People will say, well, that negative voice in my head helps me take action. It, it's not sustainable, people. It is not, I'm telling you, with all the love in my heart, that is not sustainable. It does not, you might think that's working, it's not. You know it's not, because you don't feel good. And really the goal isn't to have things to, well, it helped me finish my degree and it helped me uh, stay in my marriage and it helped me whatever, it helped me lose weight. Are you happy? If you're happy, I'll be quiet. Then that's all working for you. If you every single day wake up feeling joyous, free, excited, enthusiastic, ready for your day, satisfied, appreciative, if that's happening, you wouldn't be listening right now. You would have seen this title and passed it by because it doesn't apply to you. So it's not working. You are getting things, you are achieving, you know, whatever, but it's not working. Working means you are living a happy, joyous, connected life. That's what we're here for. We're not here to be something, you know, to, to check things off a list. We are here to live in connection and joy on a daily basis. And that's what I want for you. It is absolutely possible. It is absolute, it's in, it's aspirational. If you don't have it yet, it's here. Think about that, that inspired and take action for that to get to that as opposed to, I don't want to have this bad thing happen. I don't, I want to avoid these negative things. And that's what's motivating you. That's what's keeping you alive each day. Uh -uh. Uh Uh-uh, (laughs) uh-uh. That is not what I want for you. I adore you. I love you. Please, I'm begging you. Start thinking about what you do want, not what you don't want. Start taking action from your inspiration and not your negative motivation. All right, we're here, we're done. That is it for today. I, as always, am very appreciative of this time together. Really appreciative of you spending, you know, your hours with me, your minutes with me, whatever it's been, and just your intention and your willingness to hear what I'm saying means so, so much. So come over to the website, abbymedcalf.com forward slash, this is the shop page where I have the mindfulness uh, starter kit, or, um, oh, actually it might not be there. I lied. I might just lied right now. The mindfulness starter kit will for sure be at abbymedcalf.com forward slash podcast and it'll be on this episode it uh you know there'll be a link to it it will um be underneath if you're watching the video whatever anyway it'll be around i promise it's there and if you need to you can just um type it in the search engine of my website that's it uh i love you have a wonderful wonderful week and i will talk to you soon